Hi, my name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. Well, here's a blast from the past. This is Duna 1. Yeah, this was launched uh, 280 game days ago. And to put that maybe into even more of a perspective, that episode, I uploaded it to YouTube 17 real world months ago. <laughs> So yeah, that was a long time ago indeed. And I mean, look at this thing. The tech is so old on it. I didn't even have deployable solar panels back then, so I had to cover it up with these Oxdat solar panels. And what I'm doing here is I just want to play around. I'm still about a good 29 days or so from Duna, so that's not going to be happening this episode, but hopefully pretty soon. And I'm just playing around seeing if I can get myself a capture nice and cheaply using Ike for a gravity assist, but uh, playing around a bit, it turned out that just wasn't going to be in the cards. But checking in on these interplanetary vessels, actually, that turns out to be a bit of a theme in this particular episode. Uh, we'll be checking in on the Kermes 2, uh, a crewed mission on its way to EVE. We haven't seen them in a little while. We'll do a brief check-in and see how they're doing. Uh, and we'll also be checking in on the Drez 1, which is getting close to doing its rendezvous with the Kermes 1. Uh, the, both of these vessels are on their way to Drez, and, uh, well, my transfer to Drez was less than ideal. And I'm trying to see what I can salvage uh, by sharing fuel between these two vessels and try and salvage uh, the maximum amount I can from this mission and still get my Kerbals safely back home. But the big thing that's coming up in this episode is I'm finally making the jump to 1.2, specifically 1.2.2. I got everything working, it seems, for now, knock on wood. Everything seems to be working, and that jump will be coming up in a little bit. I'll point it out when we make the jump from 1.1.3, which is right now, to 1.1.2. Uh, I also have a launch coming up. I have a station on its way to the moon. We'll be launching that. And uh, we'll also be checking in on the Korion 3, which is making its, its way back to Kerbin Station from the moon to see if I can get some Kerbals back down to the surface and level them up. In the meantime, uh, I ended up giving up on this idea of getting an Ike Gravity Assist and just satisfied myself with a little tiny correction, a 0.3 meter per second burn. Note here that I'm playing with the engine settings and that despite the signal delay thanks to remote tech that these engine settings are changing instantaneously, that will change soon. And then once I ended up doing this burn, uh, I just wanted to make sure that my periapsis is nice and low in relation to Duna and that my resulting trajectory will be in the plane of Ike because that will maximize my options once we get into Duna's sphere of influence, but that's not going to be for another 29 game days. So we'll have to see where we're at at that time. In the meantime, let's get to the launch. At 308 tons, this is uh, one of my bigger boys. By my standards, this is a pretty big boy. Being lifted off the pad by a cluster of eight kickback solid fuel boosters because whenever I can use the SRBs I do like to use them because I think they look good and hopefully this will turn into a permanent moon station for me specifically actually the plan is going to be to connect it to asteroid Yoy and use that whole asteroid as kind of a orbiting moon base on top of the requisite life support, communication, and power generation, this thing features a hitchhiker can and, for the first time, the Kerbal Interstellar Extended Science Lab, which I've never used before. It is heavier than the stock laboratory module. In fact, with the uh, tug that's going to be taking this thing out to the moon, this the payload itself weighs in at 37.5 tons, so that is not insignificant. You can start to get a little bit of a better look at this thing. That is the interstellar lab module lit up there in the middle. And towards the back end here, we have our tug to take it out to the moon. It's connected with a 2.5 meter docking port. Because I do have a 2.5 meter base already there. And then we have this storage 
open this up and I got quite a bit of stuff but it, the struts is what I really want because I really want to strut this thing down to the asteroid hopefully make it nice and stiff and kind of take the wobble out of it you can also see there at the front I have only a single shielded docking port there attached to the uh, hab module so and this thing has no RCS on it at all, so it's going to need uh, some help <laughs> connecting to the asteroid. My original idea was to have the Korion do it, but I have the Korion 3 on its way back. I do have that big fuel barge. It does have RCS on it, so perhaps I, I should be able to hook up the fuel barge and use that to get this thing into place. We'll see how it goes. But the transfer window for getting out to the moon is not going to be for another two and a half days. So it's going to have to be probably next episode that we'll be seeing all of that happening. In the meantime, well, I'm making the jump to 1.2. Where I'm in the VAB repurchasing parts uh, for some reason. Some parts that I have purchased in the past, now I have to purchase again. And I'm keeping track of how much money I'm spending so that I can... Uh, reimburse myself so to speak <laughs> and get me my money back because I don't think it's I don't think I should have to buy things more than once uh, but there are a number of new stock parts that I'm interested in so I am picking up some of those as well the mole uh, mod has had a huge expansion in the meantime there's tons of really cool parts here and I actually have to keep myself under some control because I don't want to spend too much money doing this but speaking of lots of new parts, this gives me an opportunity to talk about a new mod that I've got installed. This is called Janitor's Closet. Um, and what you can do is you can use it to block parts. So if you have like, you know, these, these inventories start to get really, really cluttered with parts. And if there are parts that you have unlocked but you're not using anymore, you can uh, block them so that they won't show up on the inventory screen. And it's really easy to unblock them once again if for whatever reason later on you decide you want it back. It does give you this option to permablock a part. Uh, what it does is it ends up renaming the part file so that when you boot up KSP, it doesn't even load the part. Um, that'll save you memory, but uh, you do have to be careful because <laughs> it is permanent uh, you'll have to do some work to get that part back if you end up wanting to have it back so you got to be a little bit careful with that feature I also want to show you the new simulation mode crash that's Kerbal Ramification Artificial Simulation Hub not to be confused with Kerbal Crash System which is actually a mod I've also had installed in the past that simulates uh, visible damage on parts when parts take damage um, the reason why this is installed is because um, Kerbal Construction Time, its simulation mode, no longer works. It seems to be a feature that they are taking out. I'm currently working with a dev build of Kerbal Construction Time, but it seems to be working pretty good. But you need to have Crash installed here, so I want to show you how this works. The vehicle you see here is the Otter X1, my single stage to orbit crew transport that I had to redesign because suddenly a set of reaction wheels that I had buried in the middle of the vehicle were producing a crap ton of drag and I couldn't get this thing into orbit anymore so I had to take those reaction wheels out and I thought I'd take the opportunity as well to play a little bit with the fuel overlay. I might take an opportunity to talk about that maybe in a future episode but what I want to do is talk about this uh, crash system simulation mode. So all you need to do here is click on the sim button and choose a location from which you want to start the simulation. You can also start simulations from orbits and orbits around other bodies and things like that. Very similar to Kerbal Construction Time. And then we go out here and we start our mission normally. Again, very similar to Kerbal Construction Time, except when you hit escape to leave the mission, you will end up reverting back to the space plane hangar. And anything that you accomplish while doing this mission, of course, doesn't count because this is a simulation. One thing that's a little bit different is uh, instead of choosing your length of simulation from the beginning, that's what happened with Kerbal Construction Time, you don't make that choice. Instead, though, what you got is this count cost counter that's up here at the top left, unfortunately right underneath the uh, connection window that comes from Remote Tech. And it's giving you what the cost is. It's counting up the cost. Um, so basically you run the simulation until that number gets too high for you to deal with anymore. And then you can end the simulation. 
Anyway, uh, I ended up getting this thing the way I wanted it, but unfortunately when it came time to push it into the building queue from Kerbal Construction Time, the build time is now 18 days. Um, I think what happened here is I lost my recovered part inventory that Kerbal Construction Time keeps track of, so it's building this thing from scratch. Oh well, <laughs> I need to push this game forward in time anyway. Why don't we get ourselves back out into interplanetary space? This is the Kermes 2 on its way to Eve. Still a long way to go, but oh, wait, where, where are my scientists? I should have a crew of four here. I only see two. Let's check the uh, science lab. Well, I can see them there. It's Luya and Diltop. I can see their inventories. I can also see that I have 56 science but I don't have a transmit science button. Okay, something is not right. I also have no way of transferring them out of there. Now this is the mole science lab. And somehow, I don't know, it got messed up and I ended up fixing it and all I did was actually get the part pre-update, the 1.1.3 version of this part and put that part in instead and that fixed everything up and I was able to transmit my science and I was able to get my scientists back. So I suppose no harm done. Though somehow my center of mass got moved about. I had this thing all balanced as best I could so that when it was rotating to generate gravity, it was spinning about the central axis. But now you can see there is a definite wobble. So somewhere some masses got changed. Oh well. Oh, what can you do? So, uh, well, let's leave these folks on to their journey and let's get ourselves a little bit closer to home. Where we'll join the Korion 3 in orbit about the moon, getting ready to make its ejection burn to send it back towards Kerbin. I'll draw attention to another new mod that I have installed. This one was recommended by a viewer actually quite some time ago, but I just haven't installed it until now. It's called Better Burn Time. It does a better job of calculating the length of the burn. A uh, better job than stock anyways. And now my burn times actually match the predictions that are given to me by Kerbal Engineer, which is fine. But what it also seems to be doing, at least I think it's doing it, It's I don't think it's a stock 1.2 thing, is it's giving me this little uh, countdown timer down here near to the nav ball. Yeah, you see those little dots there counting off? Well, that's pretty neat. And there we go. I always like to start a second or two before the actual halfway point. Just because I'll end up reducing my thrust towards the end of the burn. But of course this is entirely routine. We've done this lots and lots of times before. So why don't we skip ahead a few hours. Getting to the point where these guys are getting ready to do their arrow breaking pass. Now you might recall from a few episodes ago that the Korion 1 while performing its arrow breaking pass lost its air brakes. Yeah I'd forgotten how fragile these things are. So this time around I'm uh, keeping my finger near the brake button getting ready to uh, retract these air brakes should they get too hot. So I'm keeping careful attention, paying careful attention to the uh, critical temperature that's being given to me by Kerbal Engineer. And if it starts to get too close to 100%, I'm just going to retract these air brakes. And, whoa, whoa, wait, whoa. What? Just lost a radiator. What the hell happened there? You know what I think that was? I think that was the radiator that I had just replaced a couple of episodes ago. Well, let's get these air brakes down. They are getting kind of hot. <laughs> um, yeah, I replaced that radiator a couple of episodes ago. And what I think happened is, I think I stuck it right on top of the broken radiator. And I think KSP still considered that radiator to be deployed. So the deployed radiator that was broken came off and took the new one that was on top of it off with it. Oh, what a drag. Anyway, the rest of this arrow breaking went without a hitch, so why don't we leave these folks for this episode? We'll get back to them again next episode as they make their way to Curb and Station and make one last trek out into interplanetary space. Where I'm with the Drez 1, which is closing in on the Kermes 1 
on their way to Dres. We want to do a rendezvous here, and I'm just finishing off setting up this burn. There we go. We got a closest approach of zero kilometers. Our encounter speed is 32.2 .2 meters per second, and that is in just under four hours. Awesome. Okay, so this is just going to be the tiniest of burns. So uh, I should probably turn down the thrust limiter here on this engine. Here we go. Let's turn it down around 50. Uh-oh. Oh, it's not changing. I think Remote Tech might have made a fix. Let's take a look here. Yeah, you can see it's in the command queue. <laughs> so it's taking those tweakables in for the uh, signal delay. So now everything you do with the Pro, this is the way it should be, quite honestly. This is this is really a fix, but that's okay. So now we've got two, one, and boom. There we go. So our thrust limiter is now about 50%. Oh, I probably want it lower than that, but I won't show you all that fiddling around that I did. Why don't we cut ourselves straight to the burn? Okay, just a couple more seconds. There we go. <laughs> just a couple of puffs from that nuclear engine. Okay, let's see what we got. So looking at our closest approach here, 0.3 kilometers, that's a that'll do, in about three and a half hours. So we'll get right back out to these guys in a moment, but I actually have one more vessel that I have to jump to and an issue I have to deal with. Yeah, this is the RMB performing its ejection burn, getting it out of its out of uh, the moon's sphere of influence. But instead of going back to Kerbin, this is out to hunt down another asteroid. So once this burn was done, I went and set up a correction burn. Ended up getting a 1.3 kilometer closest approach in a little over 12 days. So that'll be exciting. Another no, third in my asteroid missions in this particular series. But we'll have to revisit this vessel again in the future. Let's get ourselves back to our encounter with the Drez and the Kermes 1. My problems with this mission started back with the Drez injection burn when I dropped two full radial tanks of fuel that obviously left these folks then short. And I actually botched it up in a bit of a different way too in that my trajectory out towards Drez is going way too fast. I burned way too much fuel to get out here. And so I'm going. my Drez encounter is going to be expensive and these folks just simply don't have the fuel to do it. Now one of the things I did a couple episodes ago is I docked a lander that was also on its way to Drez. It's still actually docked with the station there. You can see it there on the bottom left. But I drained all the fuel out of it and its transfer vehicle. I just have the lander kind of hanging around for now because it does. it's the only thing that has RCS and I might need that very, very shortly. But what I've decided to do with these folks is just do a Drez flyby. We're not going for a capture about Drez with this particular vessel. I think the safer thing to do is just to go for the flyby. So what I'm interested in doing is figuring out if these folks have enough fuel to spare that they can give it some extra fuel to the Drez 1 so that it can perform its full mission that it was intended to do. So I'm just playing around here a little bit and I'm figuring that with a combination of a burn at periapsis around Drez, because I do want to get in close to Drez so I can get some near space science, and another burn, another correction burn out past Drez that I, sh I think I can get these folks back for about two kilometers per second of delta V. And in fact, looking at this right now, I can see I'm actually even coming around the wrong side of Drez to get my, this is actually giving them a gravity boost. I want to slow them down as they come around Drez. So actually, I think it's going to even be less than that. I'll have to figure that out. And the good news is, is they currently have, according to Kerbal Engineer, 5.2 kilometers per second of delta V. That's with that lander still attached to them. And I plan on ditching that. So that's good news. And also while playing around with maneuver nodes and trajectories, uh, I figured out that my capture around Drez was going to be about 4,100 meters per second. So I then hopped back out to the nearby Drez 1. And knowing what the mass of the Drez 1 was, and also knowing the ISP of its engine, I could use the rocket equation and figure out that this thing needed about an additional 3.75 tons of reaction mass in order to get the 4,100 meters per second it was going to need to do the capture. And that translates to 750 units of liquid fuel. 
The Kermes right now has 9,784 units of liquid fuel, so I should have plenty. So, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the plan. I'm going to end up rendezvousing these two guys. We'll give these folks about 700, or these folks, this probe, about 750 units of liquid fuel. And that should leave it with enough fuel to be able to perform its mission entirely. And we'll do the flyby with the Kermes and we'll get those folks back home. But the first thing I need to do is get this rendezvous happening. So I ended up setting up this sort of breaking burn that reduced my encounter velocity to 10.6 meters per second. And that encounter is going to be five minutes after this burn is performed. So that should give me plenty of time to do the final breaking maneuver after which I'll close the gap with the Kermes, because that thing I can control directly without a time delay. And here we are approaching the burn. I'll draw attention to a couple of things. Number one is that waypoint towards the top right. That is the Kermes 1, now just a little over four kilometers away. And I'll also draw attention to the top left that I have no connection to mission control. That's okay, because I do have the burn command put in. So the flight computer from Remote Tech will execute the burn anyway. There it goes. And then I got five minutes before my closest approach to try and figure out this connection issue. Uh, I suspect probably a relay satellite has just drifted in behind Kerbin in its orbit. Shouldn't be a problem because this has a deployed Communitron 16 on it. That's an omnidirectional antenna. So if I can get a connection out to the Kermes, it will be able to relay a signal out to this Dresplo. We're close enough now for that to be able to happen. So here we are with Interplanetary Relay 2, and we'll point that at the Kermes 1, and then out at the Kermes 1, we'll take its dish antenna and point it at Interplanetary Relay 2. That means it should be now relaying a signal out to the Dres 1. And there we go. Okay, we are live. Now, we are getting close to two kilometers away from our target, so we still have a relative velocity of 10 meters per second, so we best get serious here. So let's get in a maneuver node and kill off that most of the rest of that velocity. Uh-oh. Uh oh, I can't. Oh, dear. I think I'm too close. I can't get a maneuver node in here. I can't zoom in close enough. Okay, okay, we got the uh, remote tech flight computer. Let's bring that up. It does have this burn button. And it looks like I can just put in a delta V for the burn. Okay, okay, I think I can make this work. Okay, so let's put this into target and put us on the retrograde vector relative to the target. And then I'll just put in 10 meters per second and hit burn. This should work. Okay, two, one, burn. Okay, nothing happened. Why did nothing happen? Oh shoot, I have my throttle at zero. On the flight computer, there's a throttle in the, uh, throttle slider. Okay, I gotta put that up to 100% and then put in that 10 meters per second once again. Try this one more time. Should work this time. All right, there we go. Okay, so it looks like this is gonna burn for about another four seconds or so. Excellent. And again, I'm not shooting to get the velocity down to zero. I'm just uh, getting it uh, down a little low and then we'll wait a second my velocity what wait okay the command is done but I'm still burning why am I still burning try canceling the command but I don't understand what went on now looking at the video now it didn't occur to me until actually while I'm doing this voiceover that perhaps I should put in another command to set the throttle back to zero and now the throttle is stuck at a hundred percent. I tried just canceling it. We got a few seconds more for that cancel to come in. 
but we might as well turn around because I'm going away from the Karai now at actually quite a good clip. Oh my gosh, we're going at 30 meters per second away from the Karai, or the Kermes. Okay, the cancel didn't work, so we'll turn around. And you know what? I think what I'll do is I'll step this up, uh, make this playback quite a bit faster because uh, this is a rather comical back and forth that went for quite some time. I never quite did figure this out. I should get back in here and see if I can figure it out or if you guys have any input for me, it would be greatly appreciated. Eventually I stopped putting in delta Vs to define how long the burn should be and just put in times and I did these five second burns though to be quite honest it wasn't like I was that much more successful <laughs> with it that way I ended up again blasting right by and then having to turn around and go back the other way and I finally got so frustrated that uh, finally at one point I was within about a kilometer of the Kermes though going towards it at 30 meters per second where I said the hell with it and I quickly hopped over to the Kermes and figured I would just close the gap with this thing. Not that that was a particularly easy thing to do, the uh, lander that's still docked with it, it uh, throws off the center of mass quite a bit so this thing has a tendency to want to yaw to one side. In addition the only RCS is on the lander, there are no RCS thrusters anywhere else on the Kermes so uh, all the RCS was really really unbalanced but eventually I did get it in here close enough that Glafia could get out there and with a couple of KAS fuel pipe uh, endpoints and connect this on together and oh by the time this all got done I mean I do have to do some fuel transferring and stuff but by this point I was just so exhausted <laughs> I said that's it okay we're there I'll deal with everything else so that's going to have to be next episode we'll do some fuel transferring we'll send these two vessels off on their respective missions but for now I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope to see you again next time